Is Cinderella a social engineer? That terrifying monster trying to break into the office, or did he just forget his badge again? Find out with WorkBytes, a new security awareness training series from InfoSec. The series features a colorful array of fantastical characters, including vampires, pirates, aliens, and zombies as they interact in the workplace and encounter today's most common cybersecurity threats. InfoSec created WorkBytes to help organizations empower employees by delivering short, entertaining, and impactful training to teach them how to recognize and keep the company secure from cyber threats. Compelling stories and likable characters mean that the lessons will stick. So go to infosecinstitute.com slash free to learn more about the series and explore a number of other free cybersecurity training resources we assembled for cyberwork listeners just like you. Again, go to infosecinstitute.com slash free and grab all of your free cybersecurity training resources today. Today on Cyberwork, I'm talking to Leonid Belkin, Chief Technology Officer and co-founder of Torque, a no-code security automation platform. After I asked him buckets and buckets of questions about the day-to-day -day work of a Chief Technology Officer or CTO in the tech field, we get into a fascinating discussion of all the ways that automation will change the work of cybersecurity, allowing professionals at all stages to work at higher order problems while the great automated data sifters do the high-speed data analysis beyond, beyond our cognition below. This one gets pretty heavy, folks, especially once we compare CTOs to orchestra conductors. And come along with us, I swear, it the metaphor totally works. That's all coming up today on Cyberwork. Each week we talk with a different industry thought leader about cybersecurity trends, the way those trends affect the work of InfoSec professionals while offering tips for breaking in or moving up the ladder in the cybersecurity industry. Leonid Belkid is a co-founder and the chief technology officer at Torque, a no-code security automation platform. Prior to Torque, Leonid co-founded and was CTO of Luminate Security, a pioneer in zero trust network access and secure access services edge, uh, where he guided his enter uh, this enterprise grade service from inception to Fortune 500 adoption to acquisition by Symantec. Before Luminate, Leonid uh, managed engineering organizations at Checkpoint Software Technologies that delivered network, endpoint, and data security products to the world's largest organizations. So um, when Leonid contacted me today, he, he, he pointed out that there are other uses of automation that aren't just uh, developer focused. And uh, you know, I'm always up for learning something new. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to um, uh, getting some insights here. Leonid, thank you for joining me today and welcome to Cyberwork. Thank you, Chris. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, great. So let me uh, start with your uh, your origin story, your background. Uh, how did you first get interested in uh, computers and tech? I mean, based on your career path and the jobs you've held in the past, it seems to go back very, very far. Uh, what was the initial draw? Or have you always just been a computer person or tinkering person? I've been born to this. Uh, yeah. Both of my parents, my late father and my mother, are uh, in the industry Oh, really? uh, my mother was a software engineer. My father uh, was doing a lot of uh, uh, digital video, multimedia stuff, et cetera. So, so you know, uh, I could say it's a family business, not yeah. not in a sense that family owns it, but in a sense that family deals with it. Yeah, for sure. Now, um, so, you, so you said, okay, uh, software developer, mom, uh, audio video, dad, and son who works in primarily in security was that was there a specific sense of like well they they have these niches and then this or was it just that that was what oh, interested um, you being an israeli i uh, got a chance to serve in um military units that deal yep. with security technology uh, this is where i got exposed to this world um mm -hmm. made me very passionate about it um and i have been applying this passion in the commercial world ever since yeah. Now, I've, I've had several guests who uh, had similar stories of coming up through the the Israeli military and the and the you know the service. Now, I, I'm going to ask you the same thing I ask them. Did the knowledge you got on that job was that something that you you came in with and were were put into that position because you already had that knowledge, or was it I'm I'm here I want to learn this this thing and then they said uh, well, okay we'll 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 put you in this particular area of like security and tech yeah I don't think it was uh, about the knowledge so I grew up mm -hmm. as uh, what we call in Israel and it's an actual term a PC kid which yeah. means kid that deals with computers from a very early age I was uh, working for a software company digital video streaming one when I was in an high school um getting uh, normal paychecks like a grown up person would yeah. um 
and uh, and I think it's it's this general knowledge, not particular around cybersecurity, that positioned me uh, for that kind of a service. And from that point on, as you said, you know, you learn something, you feel passionate about it, so you take up your free time and learn more about it, and yep. uh, that's how you get the snowball rolling. Yeah, yeah. And so by the time you were you were uh, in the service, you already had a, a, a series of skills that you could sort of show and say, this is this is stuff I can do really well. And then they were able to sort of place. Your it's program. a good starting point. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So before we can begin our, our topic discussion today, um, I want to talk a little bit about your professional career, uh, uh, you know, from then up until the present day. So you've you've held numerous positions with increasing responsibility, responsibility and complexity. Um, but the two types of positions uh, that show up multiple times, there's chief technology officer, CTO, uh, and uh, variations on the concept of endpoint security, as well as mobile information protection. So I'm guessing that endpoint security is one of your chief areas of interest. Can you tell me about the types of projects you worked on in endpoint protection or mobile info protection, some of the more interesting aspects of, of these things and, and, and what they hooked you with? Absolutely. So, you know, um, growing up as a manager in a large cybersecurity vendor, Back in the days, it was Checkpoint Software Technologies. And during the first decade of uh, the century, they were probably the industry's largest and most comprehensive cybersecurity vendor. I got a privilege to, uh, first of all, get exposed to how world's biggest and most important enterprises run their cybersecurity, and also to contribute around multiple areas. You know, cybersecurity, as you perfectly know, has the notion of defense in depth, right? There is no single, this is the layer that uh, is yep. superior to others in importance. And I had a privilege of um, leading some traditional network security products, okay. um, then moving to work a little bit on remote access identity and access management layer. Then indeed, for a long period of time, I was leading checkpoints and point security efforts. Um, this is, by the way, where the industry was beginning to go into endpoint detection and response. And I was very privileged to, to work with the early teams that did threat research, threat prevention. Um, we were among the first in the industry to realize the power of combining endpoint site detection and prevention with network site detection and prevention. During the same period, enterprises started seriously considering going into you know, mobile devices as means of an increased productivity, which is wonderful, but mm -hmm. which introduced a new frontier of security challenges. Oh, so yeah. this is how I moved from more traditional enterprise centrally managed endpoint, which used to be a desktop and a laptop, to a slightly more different, but not less important and not less sensitive in terms of the information it get access to uh, mobile, right? Yep. So, you know, it was a um, working for a large vendor gave me a tremendous opportunity to actually go around multiple layers of this defense in-depth uh, organizational policy and serve them from the technologist side. Yeah. Now, um, I mean, do you, do you feel like endpoint as, as a sort of area of focus has changed dramatically in the last three years or so with a uh, mass work from home, uh, you know, uh, and, and so forth. Absolutely. Yeah. It seems like it really is like the cutting edge thing right now. What, what are you, what are you seeing in, ter in terms of that? You know, philosophically, right. Mm -hmm. uh, when we started uh, the security journey, we were all very much perimeter centric, right. Our yep. perimeter ran around our offices where we all uh, yeah. went to work every you morning. You really were thinking of it like a moat around your office. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is the, the, the castle with a moat with a yep. couple yep. of gates and the security focusing on these gates and what passes through them indeed was the early um, sort of like paradigm of, of security. Even before the pandemic happened and everybody started to work either predominantly from home or hybrid and so on, the, this mode thing started falling apart. A cloud yeah. deteriorated, took a part of it. Um, mobile yep. actually contributed to that uh, process oh, yeah. and so on, right? So, so there has been a ongoing decentralization process when it comes to organizational infrastructure, so IT services and so on uh, for the past decade, right? And now when we look at it and we ask, uh, like, think about an information employee, where do we draw the protective layer? And, mm -hmm. and actually it, it comes around their identity and their endpoints that they use to perform right. uh, whatever operations they are doing on a daily basis. That is why the, the importance of 
this particular protective unit has tremendously grown throughout the past decade. Yeah, yeah, no, it's 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 gone from uh, you know protecting a castle to pr- protecting a series of tents out in the woods or something like Be- that. Yeah, because that's where we are right that's now. Where we are, right? Yeah, we're, very few things are in the castles, from, yeah. and um, every tent became a very very protected compound. Yeah, yeah, and as one as one falls, so fall the other somehow. Uh, oh, yes. So yeah, uh, so uh, we talked to a fair few um, CISOs, chief information security officers, and CEOs. But we don't get as many CTOs, chief technology officers. So, uh, you know, a good portion of this podcast is is helping new listeners to understand what the day to day work of certain job roles is. So can you tell our listeners about your average kind of day at uh, as a CTO of Torque and how that work differs at all from past CTO roles you held at companies that you didn't sort of co-found? Absolutely. So, you know, chief technology officers role is much less well-defined, in my humble opinion, than Chief Information Security Officer or CIO. And even more so, it is much more vertical or even domain-specific. Let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. It it is very true that, uh, for example, if you're a Chief Information Security Officer in, say, pharmaceutical industry, sure, I mean, you can move from a smaller company to a bigger one, but it's not entirely out of uh, the contention that you would move and become a CISO at, say, financial or or maybe retail, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, Yeah. you you will need to learn uh, new technologies, et cetera, but, but the main gist of the profession head of the cybersecurity program, and the components of the program remain. Similarly, we could talk about infrastructure, be it on-prem, cloud, or hybrid, and how indeed manufacturing companies has a vastly different infrastructure than, say, fintech. And still, as a chief information officer, there are a lot of commonalities. CTO, in my experience, is particularly being a CTO in technological companies, meaning companies that either develop and deliver a technological product or okay. provide a technological service, right? Service providers also have CTO. So in there, the role of the CTO is dual. The best definition of it is, believe it or not, in my humble opinion, what you do not do. If you find a CTO that says, oh, I manage the product development, etc., that would probably mean that they're not really doing the CTO job. They're doing the VP R&D job. Yes. Uh, we have, for example, a Torque um, and my previous companies, very capable vice presidents of R&D. In some cases, they would report to a CTO. In other cases, they, they would not. It doesn't really matter. Of course, there's a lot of synchronization. So as a CTO, I have two sides. The outbound side, talking to our customers, our prospects, uh, thought leaders, etc., is where I represent the technological vision of what we deliver. I evangelize it. I do a lot of, in collaboration with our very capable head of product management, I do a lot of work on product strategy, again, from the technological perspective. I do a lot of higher executive planning of the company strategy, large investments, et cetera, et cetera, looking at the business units, bringing in my technological perspective, the same way our, say, CFO brings their financial perspective, our chief human officer brings their human resources perspective, et cetera. So this is more like the outbound world. Yes. I also have a half of my role that is more inbound, in which I take the learnings from where the market is going, what the analysts are envisioning, what uh, the customers and prospects are looking for, and I influence our internal organizations, be it field engineering, product engineering, product management, internal uh, IT uh, technologies, etc., with this thing. So this is a CTO role. And as you can imagine, it is very tightly dependent and connected to what the company is actually doing. Yeah. Um, to, uh, to just get it even a little more granular, can you give me an example of like a, the ty- a type of decision you would have to make both in the sort of outbound uh, CTO role and the, and the inbound? Like what, what is that? What is a, a, a something, you know, in terms of like, is it like deciding 
to use this piece of tech or that piece of software? Oh, or what absolutely. Have no, yeah. it's less about using. Okay. So, uh, you know, what? Let, let's let's take Fork as a very concrete example, explain yep. in a sentence or two what we're doing, and then uh, take some of the decisions I made and how to influence. So Torque, mm-hmm. we are a security hyper automation company. We right. deliver a product that allows people reporting to chief information security officer be it incident responders, application security architects, cloud security um, architects, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to automate processes that they would otherwise do uh, manually. Click here, take this, take it yeah. there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that's uh, what we deliver. There is a very deep value proposition in it. Now, as a company, we make a lot of investments in developing this technology, a lot mm. of investments in partnering with other technological vendors. Uh, yes. How do we prioritize it? What use cases would our users want to automate with Torque, or maybe not necessarily want with Automate, but discover that Torque can automate and benefit from it, etc. Mm-hmm. right? It's the connection of, so as a result, do we need as an organization to invest more in AI and machine learning. No, 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 no. We need to invest more in big data because we'll be crunching yeah. terabytes. Yeah. Yeah, we need to invest more in mobile technology because our users interact with our information via mobile devices rather than these are very important decisions for the company. Yes. Carry a lot of weight around a lot of investments, etc. And they are, for example, being driven by me as, as a CTO. That's more inbound. Now let's yeah. talk about outbound, right? Yes. We have a lot of industry events. We need to position ourselves in a certain way. And of course, we have extremely capable marketing people, be it product marketing or brand marketing, et cetera, et cetera. But still, it is my role to tie the messaging, provide a lot of technological expertise, et cetera. So, so that's the CTO role. In a technological company, that's you know that's yeah. the kind of thing I can talk about. Cybersecurity companies, in particular, because that's what I've been doing uh, for the past uh, you know too many years for me to admit. <laughs> um, now I've. I've... I swear I'm gonna I have other questions here, but I want to just keep going a little deeper into this because I, I really like um I mean you're really giving me the sense that there's there's almost kind of like a, a philosophical component, like you're almost kind of predicting the future in terms of and and predicting market trends and predicting uh, to make you a know, successful business functionality. Well, yeah. Wayne yeah, yeah. Gretzky once said a good hockey player is skating to where the puck is going to be and not yeah. where it is right now. A right, good right. business leader is taking their business to the place yeah. where the market is going to be and not so where what, it is what, right where, now. Where are you where are you sort of where are you gleaning these these predictions from? Wow. Uh first of all, um a lot of uh that's, that's a good one, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you try to be as data driven as you can. In fact, you know what it, it it's a combination, right? It's a, uh, you you have to listen, you have to listen very closely to your customers. On the other end, um, you know what? Big visionaries, uh, like, you know what? Founder of Ford Motors once Mm -hmm. said that, hey, if I only listened to my customers and did exactly what they asked, I'd be breeding fast horses rather than making automobiles, right? right. Mm -hmm. So, but, but still... Right. Ford Motors has listened a lot to their customers. Mm-hmm. It's just that they took this information and asked the question, why? Why do they want to get to where they want to get and tried to say, OK, uh, do, do we have maybe a better way to, to give them that? Why? Exactly the same way as, I don't know, Apple uh a company that has revolutionized the way we look at smartphones, the way we're hearing, uh, we're listening to music, etc. Right? They they listened to people. They said, "Oh, people love uh, listening to music on the go." And yeah. uh, Sony Walkman back then was the standard of how people listened on the go. They said, "But why do people like to listen on the go? How do they want to get their music? How many of it do they want to get? Etc. Etc. Etc." And then they built a totally different approach to it called the iPod that we all know yep. today. So, so that is the way you have to listen. Yep. Uh, but then there is an absolutely critical stage of asking why. And if you don't think you got it right, you you should ask it twice, thrice, and more before you can take it to the third stage, generalize and say, okay, if this is the why, then this should probably be the best possible solution delivering this why. 
you do you think that there are certain in uh, inborn like skills or talents that make a good CTO in this regard? Like if someone is saying this sounds interesting, but they don't necessarily know that they you know can be that sort of like puppet master that's seeing all the all the you know crisscrossing forces and so forth. Like what 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 in your experience working with other CTOs or just seeing them in in the world? Like what makes a good CTO in terms of skills? That's a good one. Um, first of all, I don't think you were born uh, a good CTO no, right. or CTO in general. You can definitely become. Yeah, but in uh, terms of like interests, interests and yeah. Sure, obsession. there are skills that will get you there, yeah. right? Uh, first of all, I think um, an agility is 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 very much needed. You said it yourself, right? Sort of like the link in the chain connecting multiple things, mm -hmm. which means that you need to be able to process information coming from multiple sources. You need to be able to do this thing efficiently. You need to be able, you know what, to be, um, uh, to know when to dive deeper and when to stay shallow, right? You need to be very, very pragmatic. One thing you cannot afford yourself to do is, um, you know, to uh, to to go too deep or or to uh, to to invest in just one direction. Yeah, and, and yes, that that is a skill, and that is also a knack. You know, some people love dealing with a lot of information sources it's the other way like if if they only need to do one single task they they feel bored they feel underutilized oh, yeah. etc other people you know it's it's the other way around they, they like to go deep yep. they like to yep. complete something in its the entirety thing. before so yeah. so i truly believe that former skill sets is better suited Again, for a particular CTO role I'm talking about, maybe yeah. if we talk about a CTO in a deep algorithmic research, for example, mm -hmm. there it, 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 it will require some different skill sets. Nice. Uh, so um, because you co-founded and were CTO previously of Luminate Security, which was a pioneer in zero trust network access, um, before we get to automation, I wanted to get your insights on a topic we discussed in a, pre a previous episode. So um, as someone with a considerable amount of zero trust implementation in their background, what do you think about the timeline and or logistics of the recent Pentagon directive that its entire network should be completely zero trust by 2027? You know, uh, first of all, I, I I read it. The date was uh, the date was made public with a lot of interest. Um, yeah. I'm not familiar with the uh, complexities of uh, Pentagon networks, uh, right. with the generations of uh, technologies used there. Therefore, I can't say much about this particular application. I do have um, holding a number of patents on zero trust network access, etc. Mm -hmm. I do have um, an experience with large enterprise networks adopting mm -hmm. this approach you know it's not a uh, flip a switch thing no oh, yeah. furthermore enterprises tend for a good reason to run in parallel on two or or three overlapping generations of a technology for sure right you, you would have something cutting edge then you will have something recent and you will have something older yeah. now that it's uh, harder There's to be kerosene something. powered in the basement. That's like <laughs> coughing and choking. Well, hopefully yeah, not right. kerosene powered, but say, <laughs> uh, I don't know, uh, sure, yeah. IBM mainframe or some old generation of Unix powered, right, et cetera. Right. And this is where the proverbial rubber hits the roads mm -hmm. because, uh, it is much easier if you and I established a new company right now to decide, hey, Chris and Leonid, let's go uh, zero trust network from the get go. And uh, we will deal with a lot of challenges, but that would be possible. Yes, Going right. into a major enterprise network that has these two or three generations of technology still running in production, relying on it. Mm -hmm. You know what? 2027 is in, what, four years? Mm -hmm. uh, that is uh, that is tough. That's I would an ambitious be, uh, ask, for sure. That, that's a tough That's a tough one. We, we could talk about the percentage off. We could talk about, hey, we'll cover 20% this year. Yeah, yeah. The old the long tail. Put a perimeter around your garbage and things like that. Exactly. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Uh, unless, it, 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 you know, to answer that question, I, I would ask one myself. So what is the full technology replacement cycle in your organization right what mm -hmm. is the oldest tech running right now if you tell me Ooh, we are rigorous we have four years of tech replacement cycle so, uh, chris in four years you can be 100 zero trust if you'll tell me well you know what 
main tech, six, seven years, uh, more on the outskirts, maybe eight, nine, ten. I'll say well, <laughs> you're not going to be 100% yeah. zero trust because yeah. yeah. your tech does not allow you that. And, and you will need that tech because you haven't yet replaced it. So so that's my answer. I hope it yep. makes sense. Yeah, no, totally. Uh, yeah, appreciate it. I just like sometimes I like to see uh, as long as a person has a specific knowledge, then uh, we can we can continue the conversation from previous episodes. So, uh, that's, but the topic of discussion that you brought today, uh, Leonid, is quote, reframing how we look at automation, not just software developers, but now more accessible. So for various reasons, uh, we've had several guests in a row discussing AppSec, DevSecOps, the role of automation in these processes, mm -hmm. both as time savers, but also as things that need to be caref used carefully so as not to introduce issues to be found later. Uh, so Lena, tell me about reframing our idea of automation and its uses. What are the applications for automation right now that are going unused or underused? And, and what are we not using it for right now that we should? So you see, an initial assumption that people mm -hmm. make about automation is that, oh, it saves us time, right? It mm -hmm. takes something that we would have done step by step manually, time yeah. after time after time, yep. and it does so automatically. And it does. But but here's the deal. That, that is why when we look at uh, the world of automation at Torque, we look at the term that was relatively recently coined, for example, by Gartner, that is called hyper-automation. Now, how mm -hmm. is hyper automation different from automation and and that carries the uh, its applications to different fields so hyper automation is defined as a business driven disciplined well managed approach to identify vet and automate as many business and IT processes as possible you see the starting point of hyper automation is nah, i don't uh, just want to help uh, my operators uh, cut some corners, uh, improve some yeah, things. Yeah, I is, always hear. I always hear it as a narrative of cutting out drudge work. No, I mean yeah, that's right. the, maybe the lowest hanging fruit. Right. Yes, exactly. But yeah. uh, you know, it's um, it's not the end game. Hyper automation is based on the principle that is, by the way, hopefully something that we can agree on is that look, there are so many processes in which a computer can be so much better than you and I, because we're humans, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, it's not only about saving our time. Some of these processes, Chris, they take upon uh, jobs that, that human cannot be doing. Let, let me give you a very, very typical security example. Sure. I believe that uh, in, in, in various discussions that you have had on, on, on the podcast, um, you have uh, heard the term living off the land when mm -hmm. it comes to cyber attacks. Living off the land means that an attacker will not bring in, uh, you know, malicious devices or malicious yeah. all, all right. those scary thing uh, that people love to tell uh, uh, night stories to their children about. Right? They will use relatively normative steps, like, "Hey, I forgot my password. Let's reset it." Or, "I bought a new phone. Let's reset my multi-factor authentication." Mm -hmm. Or, "I'd like to get a temporary access to some, right." Mm -hmm. Living off the land means, uh, in cybersecurity attacking terms, uh, that our attack will consist of mostly mundane events that yep. that happen in huge quantities in a in a regular enterprise. Mm -hmm. Now, w without automation, let's say, w what w what would you do? How how would you even deal with that? Would you yeah. Would you what um, hire an army of analysts that will review every every login? Yeah, and then cross check them and. and, and, and Check for patterns and yeah, sure. Yeah, it, it, it is not humanly yes. achievable, but yes. it is very achievable with automation that mm -hmm. doesn't care to process thousand events a second, ten thousand events a second, etc. However, many mm -hmm. filter them, cross them with historical events, figure yep. out if they stand out from any perspective, etc. Hyper automation allows you to. Uh, not only boldly go where no one has gone before, but actually to boldly go where no one has dreamed of being before. Yeah. But guess what? You kind of have to be there. You know, mm -hmm. these images we will have from, from funny movies where, where the hacker like intensively pushes. Yeah. Keys oh, yeah. Yeah. That's not how it works. No. <laughs> Attacking organizations also uses a lot of automation, uses a lot of volumetric attacks and so on mm -hmm. without introducing automation in your 
analysis, investigation, containment, and eventual remediation of right. various security signals. And I'm not even talking about incidents. Many of right. the signals come before and allow you to handle them so that you don't get an incident yeah. later on. That's what hyper automation is all about, right? Right. So that people not only automate away things they were doing manually, which is fun, but actually go ahead and automate things they could not have physically done manually. Yeah, it almost, it almost I, I think another guest had said that, but the way that you're able to see things that are happening in sort of parts of the network that no one ever really looks at, you're almost, it's almost like you're kind of making like a 3D rendering of like, you know, it almost has that kind of asset visibility yeah. aspect to it where, you know, you're really watching like the pipes, you know, every single, you know, uh, transmission happened between there. Can and, you be yeah. simultaneously at every junction with where something yeah. happens and right. process everything that happens there? You right. and I can't. Automation no. sure as hell can. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, um so I want to uh, sort of move from there, you, you know, mentioning that uh, automation is, is now more accessible. I'm wondering if they're are uses of automation that it could accommodate accessibility issues in end users with disabilities? Is this primarily the realm of security engineers and implement, implementation experts, or as you say, uh, moving things, uh, you know, getting getting large volumes of uh, network things, or does automation have use for regular non-security users as well, do you think? Look, if my mother can buy uh, a smart light and smart switch and using consumerized services like IFTTT and others say that every time the door opens, turn on the switch there. And every time the air condition goes off, turn off the switch and so on. These mm -hmm. are very simple automations. But then again, right. she's using them in a very consumerized environment. Now, mm -hmm. if she could do that, let's talk about people who are technologists like security analysts, like mm -hmm. security architects, etc., who don't have a goal of, I'm an engineer, I have to write something, I have to build something, this is my purpose in life. No, their purpose in life is to prevent security issues from happening. Mm -hmm. um, now, the bridge between me being able to tell you, you know what, Chris, if I got such a signal, this is what I do to investigate it. And then if the investigation would have yielded this result, that's what I would have done to contain it. If I'm able to tell you that thing in decent English or, or any other language in that sense, mm -hmm. I should be able with the right tool to turn it into something that a computer or a bunch of computers will do for me. This is a uh, thesis that we have proven over and over and over again, right? Mm -hmm. Automation simpler automation processes, using larger building blocks, reusing predefined blueprints and then just adjusting them to your uh, particularities and so on is accessible even to very junior people, right? Mm -hmm. It's not, it does not have to be as skill requiring as software engineering. By right. the way, if you do happen to have software engineering skills to a certain degree, then you can take it even further. One of the bigger challenges of simplifying automation and making it more accessible is that technologies up until now had this glass ceiling. If I give you a automation tech for uh, newbies, if you don't mind me using this word, then it's great for newbies, but for people with experience, they feel caged. One of the biggest challenges that we took up upon and according to our customers, we managed to deliver on, by the way, a lot of CTO research went into that, if you ask me, yep. is how do you how do you deliver a tool simple enough for hmm, yet very powerful enough so that extremely experienced people with plenty, 25 years of experience, don't feel caged in any way, don't feel glass ceiling, can keep on expressing themselves mm -hmm. and actually get their productivity boost. That yep. was a real challenge for us, and that's what we focused on. Okay, so I want to, um, I'm doing a bit of a balancing act, I don't know if I can pull this off, but I want to tie in uh, our previous talk about uh, CTOs and the way that you're you're acting as sort of this, um, you know, uh, analyzer of, of you know, mass mass data and, and trends and then automation, which is, you know, and so I, I'm wondering if there's some sort of like a, like an automation, almost like think tank going on in terms of the way people are thinking about how to use this and you know especially with an eye towards and i know that this is more of a uh new story issue or whatever but the you know there's always the talk of like oh automation is gonna you know automate people out of a job and then the other people say no 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 automation is gonna help you do your job better or at all because like you said there are certain things automation can do that humans 
can't do. Mm-hmm. So I, I guess I'm, I'm just trying to get a sense of like where the big discussions are are being had around all of these these different pieces. First of all, indeed, a lot of discussions are being held, right? Automation mm-hmm. and security is defined by all analysts as one of either top two or top three topics for this year, the next year, et cetera, mm-hmm. which is a good thing, right? It brings a lot of people with a lot of experiences and a lot of opinions, to, a lot of opinions to, to, to this thing tank. Now, uh, you're right, uh, or at least I agree with you. Hopefully, we're both not wrong. Automation (laughs) is not built to replace people. It is built to augment people and help them focus on where their impact is critical. Mm -hmm. And that is something that we uh, follow a lot. A lot of automations, you know, you mentioned it, I think, um, in in your opening statements. uh, Sometimes when, when people think about automation, they say, Oh, I I don't trust it. It it like does things by itself. I don't know Mm -hmm. what it does, Mm -hmm. which is absolutely 1000% if so many percents existed wrong, right? (laughs) We do a lot of what we call human in the loop automation, where the actual security decision, which has a lot of maybe business impacts, maybe financial impacts, et cetera, is being made by a human. But guess what? Thousands of information collection, processing, sifting through steps take place before that. And when the human makes their decision on which way we're going, is it route A, route B, or route C, again, tens, hundreds, thousands of steps are being executed, and the human is only involved where their ability to process recommendations, data, signals, combine it with some background and context they only have on the business, etc., where it brings the critical impact. I truly believe that this is where the decision on, yeah, we're we're an organization that will adopt uh, hyper automation. Mm-hmm. This is where it lays, you know, uh, I'm a big fan of science fiction myself. So all the ideas where robots yeah. are flying airplanes and so on and so forth, yeah. they are yeah. very appealing to me. This is not what we're talking about. We are talking about, for example, you know, decisions for years, many organizations had operation centers where people would work in shifts, where people would come in and have a huge queue of tasks. And, you know, at the end of their shift, they would say, okay, how many tasks did you take off the queue? How many of them you'd processed, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a tough job. People get burned out. People, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, an average time spent on such a yeah. job is not great. Uh, it's It's always... Instead, we can take these very people and those that are their closest colleagues and turn them into, yeah, engineers in a sense. You know what? Mm -hmm. Come to think of it, the word engineer comes from root engine, right? Mm -hmm. And engine does something for us. It takes us distance instead of us walking. It it, it allows us to hold some cargo instead of us doing it manually. And ultimately, we're we're harvesting its use. It's not just running off in a direction. Exactly. And Mm -hmm. this is, by the way, where we are at our best, understanding how to harvest the use. And this is now you need to be able to... um, build these engines indeed in the past the there was a significant barrier of entry there you needed to have many many more skills and bringing this barrier closer to you by easier tools better user experience leveraging of ai in order to help you build faster doing this in a 100 percent controlled environment Things that are built for enterprise, understand enterprise processes, enterprise permissions, enterprise Mm -hmm. role-based access control to assets, etc. That is what it's all about. And, you know, it is amazing. I have seen organizations that manage to achieve security posture and efficiency of operations that is 10 times higher than what I've seen at other comparable size organizations with like, you know, 30% headcount invested in it. And that is the kind of impact that's, you know, to round off the CTO story. Mm -hmm. How do I measure myself? Did did I, did I, did I do a good chief technologies job, like a a medium one or, or a mediocre one? Yeah. The impact, what is the impact of the technological solution that my organization delivered on the customer is when I'm hearing from a customer, Oh my God, uh, you reduced our mean time to resolve a problem by 700%, not, not 20, not 30, which would have been mm-hmm. nice, but 700. I'm like, okay, that's an impact right there. By yeah. when I'm saying, wow, we doubled 
the size of our uh, IT estate and we manage to deal with it and keep it secure with the same size of a team or slightly larger team, but by no means double size team, mm -hmm. that is an impact, right? Because you cannot yeah. uh, grow your business by growing the headcounts uh, to the same extent. So that's, you said it yourself, right? Building engines that do the hard work for us, this is ultimately the job of a CTO. Yes. And uh, sort of like the satisfaction you derive from it is by watching these engines work and deliver business outcomes. Yeah, and well, I, I, I wanna also just tie that to the notion of, uh, you know, what what your entry level job is versus where you want to go eventually. And, you know, I think any I don't know, I don't care what what, you know, level you are in your company, you know, when you get to that, you know, quarterly or yearly review, there's always, well, I did really good, you know, work on all the things that had to be done on a day to day. But I had all these stretch goals, or I had all these ambitious things. And you just never get past that sort of you know, that brute force, like, you know, nine to five, these things have to be done. These things have to be done. And what you're saying here is not that, you know, we're not going to need that worker anymore. It's that now you can start working on those kind of like higher order issues more easily if you're not sitting there and doing just the sort of, you know, raw scans. And raw reads. Mm -hmm. That's where you can be creative. That's yeah. where you can think proactively, right? Yep, yep. If, if you are constantly being pulled down by the weight of, oh, you have 100 tasks to complete today and then 100 tasks for tomorrow, etc. Mm -hmm. You know, your ability to sort of like run twice as fast as in order to have extra is, is, is evidently lower, right? Mm -hmm. This is, by the way, the biggest impact of adopting hyper automation state of mind. We have certain organizations, just to give you an example, that uh, direct, maybe even enforce, that every security signal has an automatic investigation and filtering attached to, to it, right? They buy uh, or introduce to their infrastructure another security detection system that uh, identifies yet another type of an attack on their mobile, on their data, on their cloud, on their identity, on their endpoints, on their whatever. Mm -hmm. This system is not considered production grade until you have automation handling the events. It generates yes. producing it, driving it, to resolution yeah. because buying yet another detection system and saying, oh, now somebody will have to go look there and manually handle is a recipe for disaster. All yeah. major security uh, incidents that we read about in, in the papers from recent years were not because, uh, oh, this organization was so cheap they didn't acquire a sufficient <laughs> yeah. security yeah. detection. No, it's because their data flow was too cumbersome. Yeah. And we're not correlating it properly to identify the attack. They did not have efficient means of containing, remediating. That's where the problem, again, talking about enterprise security here, mm -hmm. usually is. Yes, that's great. So, I'm, yeah, and this is that's super exciting, super inspiring. Uh, so I want to tie that directly to uh, the future um, automation tech thinkers, CTOs uh, of the world. For listeners who are just getting started and have a passion for this kind of tech heavy work and user protection, automation, want to work towards a CTO position and starting to think about and do these things, what are some skills and experiences and projects and other indicators of competence that they should be doing now to sort of show that this is that this is the direction that they, uh, that they can really be uh, useful in? Absolutely, so one skill, I would recommend acquiring is um, you need to spend some time on the front lines. You don't need to spend your whole career mm -hmm. on the front lines, uh, but 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 you need to spend some time there so that any um, anything when you say you front lines, are we mean like like you're, you're like security front lines, not the yeah. real mm -hmm. war front lines? No, no, no. I but mean, I mean like with a, like your company, like you're like in a sock or something like that. Absolutely, uh, yeah. spend mm -hmm. some time in with working closely as an app. Oh, now, why is that? Because you know what? Some experiences, some understandings of the real challenges are intangible. I could interview you all day long and I wouldn't necessarily comprehend all the challenges you have, for example, now as a podcast host. Mm -hmm. And if I did all that 
and would at least sit in with you on a number of podcasts, be a co-host, maybe try a smaller thing, mm -hmm. I would gain a invaluable understanding of the world of challenges you are facing on a daily basis that will make my ability to deliver a better solution for you uh, significantly higher. So that's that's number one. You need to have some experience on the front lines, not necessarily to be a frontline veteran. Yeah. Second point is you need to um, you need to be a little bit of a rebel, right? Uh, wait a second, don't uh, let's let's not get dragged over with with this analogy. But but yes, I I firmly believe that in order to change things, in order to make an impact on a certain level of magnitude, you, you cannot be that conformant, right? Yeah. When you are 100%, okay, that's how they taught me to do things. That's how yeah. I'm doing yeah. these things. You will limit your own ability to come up with truly original solutions, right? Mm -hmm. No, no need to break any, uh, uh, the, you know, uh, let's let's break every rule we see in the book and, and see how that works. No, definitely right. not. It's not jumping off any tall buildings, but you need to have this fully methodical ability to question why are we doing it this way what is there maybe maybe we could do it better mm -hmm. third is that um you need to have um, a certain agility with the technology like i said previously um being a cto is about being able to understand how deep or how shallow you need to stay on every um on on every like uh, question or issue right um, another, and that will probably be last, uh, CTO, unlike the title, I truly believe it's a, it's, it's a people profession, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You, you mm -hmm. know, all, all the achievements we, we make is not because we, uh, you know, build something by, by, by his hand, but, uh, we, we influence people. So mm -hmm. whether you are going to be directly managing a lot of people or indirectly impacting a lot of people you need to be a people person. You need to mm -hmm. understand the angle people are coming with. You need to understand their challenges. You need to understand how to motivate them to do something. You need to understand the with them for them in certain things and uh, uh, sort of like drive the conversation around it. Eventually, you know, it maybe could be said for every high level executive uh, uh, position, be it financial officer, people officer, marketing officer, or technology officer, you have to be people person lone genius yeah. if somebody is i'm not by the way <laughs> right. doesn't cut here right you need to be able to build a team around you trust the team around you um get the best of the team's ideas you know it's always like is is a conductor in in the orchestra is is that person always the best musician can, mm -hmm. can they play the violin better than their prima nah, probably not maybe yep. the piano no not the piano either but they do this orchestration and everybody in the orchestra is looking at them to deliver yeah. them to where they need to be kind yeah. of like that if that perspective of being a uh, the orchestra uh um, uh, director is yeah. uh, appealing to you, probably you are the right person to try this path. Yeah, I mean, I guess that also requires a, a fair amount of confidence in your own uh, skills and, and, and you know, um, uh, abilities that you're able to sort of see them all looking out at you and say, I am I am the person that's going to be able to sort of move these energies around. And you I know, think, yeah, first okay. time I walked into a room where 20 people were looking at me and waiting for me to say something mm -hmm. it was it not an easy moment for you i can tell yeah, you but <laughs> and then i've been in rooms with thousands of people oh, looking at me as well watch the first uh, 40 episodes you... of this show before if you want to know how bad i was at dinner <laughs> sorry <laughs> you just do you learn by doing in that regard i guess but yeah but yeah i just i just in in terms of like i think not even in terms of like dale carnegie type stuff but like in terms of like um you know formulating a large plan like that and having the sort of confidence of like, this is, this is the thing that we're going to do. I'm going to, you know, we're going to, we're going to marshal the troops and we're going to, uh, you know, implement this across all levels. I think that's important. And I also just want to sort of break apart what you said about being a people person, because we hear a lot on here that, uh, you know, soft skills like communication skills are very important, which I understand, like you have to be able to decipher, geek speak into c-suite uh you know budget lingo mm -hmm. and stuff but i think there's i think we don't talk enough about the fact that you need to be a people person in the idea that you have to like being 
around people. You like to Absolutely. like helping people and not have this feeling of like, well, we, you know, we got to just, we just got to get through as best we can. So I'll be the, you know, the dutiful soldier or whatever, but no, 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 no. Yeah. If you're looking at communicating with people as the necessary evil, probably you yeah. have uh, other positions where your talents will be applied to a much better result. Yeah. yeah. It needs to be a goal. You need to be truly curious about people. You need to truly yeah. enjoy conversations you have with people. You need to be able to have this information exchange and actually, you know, two people exchanging information and suddenly they get to some ideas that none of them separately had before that you need to right. drive the synergetic thing. Absolutely. Right. It's, it's yeah. by the way, uh, especially around people with a high technical acumen, this usually is a skill that requires much, much more focus, right? So mm -hmm. How many times have you heard, oh, I'm much more comfortable with a keyboard and a screen than with a person? And uh, yes, I, I have been there. And uh, uh, to achieve much more, you, you need to be more comfortable with a person and then yeah. another and, person and then yeah. another 10 people, each of which has a keyboard and a screen. Yeah, I, ideally, you should be as excited as the person at the bottom who has just discovered a new use, new use for automation that makes their job easier. You, if you're oh, you as excited, more excited than that person because yeah, you're saying, yeah. "Oh my God, I did something that makes it's, them it's all it's all starting to come together." Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Imagine, like you know, even if I come up with a great idea every five minutes, I'll only have twenty four hours divided by five minutes worth of new ideas. But mm -hmm. if I empower one hundred people to do yeah. this thing. I'll generate amounts of, or I'll cause the generation of amount of yeah. ideas that I personally could, you know, way yeah. out of my reach. Imagine that you know, a first time conductor, like doing a certain sweep of their hand and the entire violin section just follows it perfectly. How does that, how would that feel? And I think this is, you're, you're out of this in, world. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You feel like you're commanding the cosmos. So uh, as we wrap up today, um, we discussed your job tasks as CTO at Torque, and I, I really <laughs> went deep on that. But if you'd like to discuss Torque, the company more, especially the types of services you provide, uh, let, let's do that now. Absolutely. So as I already mentioned, at Torque, we provide a enterprise-grade security hyper-automation solution. Our users belong to different departments in enterprise cybersecurity organizations. Use Torque, again, not only to automate away their today's existing manual tasks, but actually to venture to processing the amount of signals and correlating the amount of data that they never managed to do manually. As Torque, we see ourselves not only as a provider of a technology, but actually as an advisor. We engage a lot with our um, enterprise security customers to help them design and then drive their hyper automation strategy. Now we do that um, because we carry the combined experience of working with different organizations in different verticals. We bring in security architects that have um, assisted in such projects that have seen organizations they worked with convert their way of thinking and reach outcomes that are far greater than they believed in. You know, I promised myself after a few technological positions I did in the past that I will not be delivering what we call shelfware, something that you buy and you put on the shelf and it sits right. there and collects dust. And this is the motto we carved on our uh, flag at Torque. We deliver outcomes. We are licensed by outcomes. We are tracking this outcomes with our champions. And this is the feedback we are constantly getting. So that, that's our motto. I, I, I'm a CTO that doesn't want you just to deliver a technology. I want to help you reach certain outcome in your business that is reached by adopting a technology. All right. Well, one final question. If our listeners want to know more about Leonid Belkin or Torque, uh, where should they go online? First of all, about Torque, you could go to HTTPS torque.io. We also have a YouTube channel, Torque.io. Um, T-O-R-Q as well. Right? T-O-R-Q. Absolutely. The yep. imaginary short spelling. Absolutely. Yeah. T-O-R-Q .io. Uh, io. Mm -hmm. uh, myself, um, you know, from LinkedIn, I guess... Uh, uh, you could get to all kinds of uh, uh, blogs or magazine articles that I publish uh, from time to time. Hit me up on LinkedIn. I will be very happy to continue the discussion from there. 
Great. Our listeners do that all the time. So uh, check your inbox sometime soon here <laughs> after it comes up. Uh, Leanna, thank, you, it. thank you so much for your time and insights today. This was an absolute blast. I really appreciate it. Loved it a lot. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, and thank you uh, to all of you who have been listening to and watching our Cyborg podcast on a massive scale. I haven't recorded the official intro, but I found out we just hit uh, 70,000 subscribers on YouTube. So thank you so much. We're really, really glad to have you along for the ride. Um, now, before I go, I want to invite you all to visit infosecinstitute.com slash free to get a whole bunch of free stuff for Cyborg listeners. Uh, we've got our new security awareness training series, Work Bytes, uh, which is a scripted live action video featuring a host of fantastical employees, including a zombie, a vampire, a princess, and a pirate making security mistakes and hopefully learning from them along with you. Also visit infosecinstitute.com slash free for your free cybersecurity talent development ebook. It's got in-depth training plans for the 12 most common roles, including SOC analyst, penetration tester, cloud security engineer, information risk analyst, privacy manager, secure coder, and more. Uh, lots to see and lots to do. Just go to infosecinstitute.com slash free and check it all out. Thank you once again to Leonid Belkind and Torque, and thank you all so much for watching and listening. And as always, we will talk to you next week. Take care now. Thank mm-hmm. you.